Hello everyone, it's Dr. Omende again. So we continue with our lecture series on uh, the pelvic viscera. So we start with the vagina. The vagina is a fibromuscular um, tube from the vulva to the uterus and usually forms an angle of 60 degrees with the horizontal plane. So that's um, the vagina. So usually its anterior wall is 8 to 9 centimeters but the posterior wall is longer at 10 to 11 centimeters. Vaginal fornices, pro, uh, the cervix usually project in the upper blind end of the vagina that forms a pouch around the cervix. So you can see uh, at that point. All right. And um, these uh, are divided into four fornices two lateral, one anterior, and one posterior, which is deeper. That, these are the fornices where the cervix, because the cervix is deeping. Uh, um, projecting, sorry, deeper into the, the vagina. So the vagina is supported by ligaments. We have ligaments that attach to the upper vagina. We have pubocervical ligaments anteriorly into the pubic bone. We have the Mackendroth's ligaments laterally, the uterosacral ligament posteriorly. The vagina is also supported by levator ani muscles with the pubovaginalis part. We have the triangular ligament and perineal membranes and vaginal fascia that contains connective tissue so all these are support structures for the vagina so you can appreciate this is the bladder here and this is the vagina so we have the puboureteral ligament here then we have the uterosacral going posteriorly you have vesicle vaginal ligaments anteriorly you have part of the um, levator ani muscle that support the vagina you have the rectal vaginal septum so the vagina is supplied by vaginal artery from internal iliac but also get some uh, branches from middle rectal of internal iliac and inferior rectal of internal pedendal artery which comes from internal iliac artery then we have uh, flexes of veins around the vagina that drain into the internal iliac vein so appreciate vaginal arteries there okay from internal iliac the lower third of the vagina drains its lymphatics into inguinal lymph nodes, while the middle third goes to uh, can go upwards and downwards, and the upper third uh, follows the lymphatics of the cervix. So this is the vagina here. So the upper will go and follow the lymphatics of the cervix that go to the iliac. Then the lower part goes to superficial inguinal nodes, and the middle can go upwards or downwards into internal iliac. Or superficial inguinal. The vagina is supplied by the dental nerve that gives it its sensory fibers. So we have what we call vaginal prolapse when you have weakness in the ligaments, fascia and muscles that support the vagina and if the vagina vaginal wall prolapses you can have cystocele or urethrocele so this is the vagina but you can have the herniation of the bladder through anterior vaginal wall that gives you cystocele. Together with the urethra, it will be uh, cystourethrocele. If the posterior wall is weakened, the rectum can herniate to the vagina, and that's called a rectocele or enterocele. Then, after hysterectomy, after removal of the uterus, okay, you can have bolt prolapse. Okay, the remaining uh, stump will prolapse through the, the, the vagina. Then, other aspects of applied anatomy, we talked of the posterior phonics being the, large, the largest when the cervix projects into the vagina. This portion of the vagina above the cervix is what we're calling the phonics. So this posterior phonics can be approached through the pouch of Douglas when performing endoscopy or photosynthesis. So if you want to collect, usually if there is pelvic inflammatory disease or any condition in the abdomen, fluid may accumulate in the pouch of Douglas. So you just inject and get through the posterior phonics. You're able to aspirate fluid from the posterior phonics or the, uh, from the pouch of Douglas through the posterior phonics of the vagina. Then the lateral phonics may be injured during clamping the angle of the vagina in hysterectomy. Then we discuss the uterus. It has different parts. It has a body, okay, which is ex the expanded superior two thirds. It has a rounded superior part that's called the fundus and a corner, which is a, a part where the uterine tubes insert. 
The uterus also has an isthmus, which is a narrow cone that is a transition between the body and the cervix, and it's mostly obvious in naliparous women, women who have not uh, been pregnant. Then we have the cervix. Cervix is the cylindrical inferior third of the uterus, and it has a supravaginal part and an infravaginal part. also has an internal and an external force. So this is the body of the uterus. So this is the fundus, okay, and the conum is where the uterine tubes will enter. So this is the, uh, the body of the uterus. And this is the cervix. It has a supravaginal and an infravaginal part towards the vagina. Then that's the cervix with a supravaginal and infravaginal part. And the cervix has two uh, openings, an internal os and an external os. So this portion here is the isthmus, the narrowest uh, portion where there's a transition between the body and the cervix. So this is the body and this is the cervix. So that's the isthmus. Again, internal os, external os of the, the cervix. Okay, that's the fundus. This is the body of the uterus. That's the endometrial lining. This is the fallopian tube. So the uterus is usually antiflexed and antiverted. Antiflexed means it is bent anteriorly over the bladder. So this is the urinary bladder and this is the uterus. So it bends anteriorly over the bladder. That's antiflexed. While antiversion means the entire uterus is bent anteriorly in respect to the vagina. So this is the vagina. So the uterus is bent in respect to the vagina. So it's antiflexed and antiverted. Antiflexed bent anteriorly over the bladder and this bending is between the cervix and the body of the uterus this is the body and this is the cervix so antiflexion is at the junction there between cervix and body while antiversion um, is the fact that the uterus bends anteriorly with respect to the vagina some people have a introverted uterus and usually when the bladder fills it tends to slightly straighten the position of the uterus the uterus is covered by peritoneum on uh, its posterior, superior, and anterior surfaces, except the vaginal part of the cervix, and the peritoneum is reflected anteriorly onto the bladder and posteriorly onto the rectum. The double-layered peritoneal sheath on the sides of the uterus is what we call the broad ligament. So anteriorly, the uterus, anterior to the uterus, we have the vesicouterine pouch. This pouch is usually empty when the uterus is antiverted. And if the uterus is retroverted, it will contain loop of intestines. Posteriorly, the uterus is covered by, uh, separated from sigmoid colon by peritoneum, and also posterior to the uterus is the pouch of Douglas that separates it from the rectum. Superior to the uterus are the coils of the small intestines, while laterally we have the broad ligament and its content. So you can appreciate here. The uterus is covered by peritoneum on the superior and anterior aspect. The pouch of Douglas is here, which is the rectal uterine pouch, while the uh, vesicouterine pouch is here. Okay, so posterior to the uterus, you have that pouch and the rectum. And superiorly, you have peritoneum plus the bowel lobes. Anteriorly, you have the, the bladder there. So the uterus is supported by three principal factors, the pelvic flow, the pelvic viscera around it, and the, its continuity with the vagina. Although we also have the broad ligament on its side, and uh, that offers it some um, support. Then the cervix is not uh, very mobile as compared to the body of the uterus, and the cervix is held in position by transverse, or cardinal, uh, transverse cervical or cardinal ligament, uterosacral ligament, and pubocervical ligament. So the broad ligament, here it is, we say, it's a double sheet of peritoneum on the lateral aspect of the uterus, joins the lateral aspect of uterus to the pelvic wall. So its outer upper part forms the infundibulopelvic ligament in which ovarian vessels traverse to the ovary. What are the contents of the broad ligament? We have round ligaments, ovarian and uterine vessels, ureter, paramitual lymphatics and lymph nodes. Uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves, parametrial pelvic cellular tissue and fascia, embryolo embryological remnants of wolfian ducts, hydatid cysts of morgagni, epiphoron and paraphoron gartner's ducts, which are remnants from embryonic uh, material. The round ligament is a fibromuscular ligament that's attached to uterine corner. It runs downwards and forwards in between the two leaves 
of the um, two leaves of the broad ligament. It enters into the inguinal ring to the inguinal canal, enters into the internal inguinal ring to the inguinal canal, then external inguinal ring and inserts on the upper portion of labia majora. So it attaches on the uterine corner, all right, then runs downwards and forwards between broad ligaments at that portion, then enters the internal inguinal ring through the inguinal canal to the external inguinal ring, okay, then inserts onto labia majora. So usually it pulls the uterus forwards and that helps to keep it antiverted. The ovarian ligament is fibromuscular ligament that attaches the inner lower pole of the ovary to the corner of the uterus. There it is, that's the ovarian ligament. It plays no role in the support of the uterus. The cervical ligaments are the condensed thickening of pelvic connective tissue. They lie between pelvic peritoneum above and levator ana below. They usually radiate towards from, uh, outwards from the cervix to reach the, the pelvis. Okay, so these are the pubocervical ligaments. The chief that the chief supports of the of the uterus. So that's pubocervical ligament, cardinal ligament, sacro cervical ligament. There are three pairs of ligaments: the macrodots, which are the cardinal ligaments that usually fan out laterally. Okay. Then we have the uterosacral ligaments that go backwards. Okay. So uterosacral go backwards from the cervix to the sacrum, but they surround the rectum. And then you have pubocervical that extends from the cervix. They go anteriorly uh, uh, past the vagina and insert onto the posterior surface of the pubis. So those are the three pairs of ligaments. The cardinal ligaments of the cervix, uterosacral, posteriorly, and pubocervical that go anteriorly from the pubis to the cervix. So the uterus is supplied by a uterine artery from internal iliac, ovarian artery from the aorta. The uterine venous plexus are on each side of the cervix, drain into internal iliac veins and are connected to the superior rectal veins that form potosystomic anastomosis. The uterus is drained by lumbar nodes, superficial inguinal nodes, and the body uh, drains into external ilia, while the cervix into the internal ilia and sacral lymph nodes. The innervation of the uterus is definitely autonomic uh, by the inferior hypogastric plexus, largely from the uterovaginal plexus in the broad ligament. The efferents usually ascend through hypogastric plexus and spinal cord via T10 and L1 nerves. So that just shows you that the uterus gets blood supply from uterine artery and some aspects of um, ovarian artery. Okay, so ovarian artery of, of, from the outer and uterine artery from internal ilia. Then we have the fallopian tubes that extend from uterine cornea to the peritoneal cavity, and these are usually sites for fertilization. Um, Oocyte and sperm will be transported within the fallopian tube to the site of fertilization, which is the ampulla. And the uterine tubes provide connection from the exterior through the vagina to the peritoneal cavity, so infection can spread the peritoneal cavity. The fallopian tubes have parts. We have the infundibulum that has the fimbria, the ampulla which is longest and widest, the isthmus that's the narrowest, and the intramural part that passes through the uterine wall. Peritoneal relations of the fallopian tube are attached to the uh, broad ligament by the mesosalpings, and fallopian tube is supplied by tubal branches of uterine artery and ovarian artery and the veins correspond. The lymphatic drainage of the fallopian tube uh, follows those of the uterine fundus to the lumbar lymph nodes. So this is the uh, fallopian tube, the infundibulum with the fimbria, okay, this is the infundibulum with fimbria, followed by ampulla site for fertilization, then the narrowest portion is usually the isthmus before you get to the intramural part. So We'll discuss the ovary in the next lecture. Thank you very much.